All right, if you'd grab your Bibles with me. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. We were in Matthew chapter 18 a couple weeks back, but in an earlier passage. Uh, today we're going to be in verses 21 uh, through the end of the passage, basically in 35. And let me, let me read this for you, because as we continue on and looking at this reality, what is it that God is asking of us? And as we go through this, as we process this, there is something that literally is impossible for us to live out our Christian lives if we do not have this thing in place, and it's called forgiveness. God wants us to forgive. He desires that. He has himself modeled that literally from the very beginning of time. God has modeled this. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35. And this is a parable that Jesus shares with his disciples. And if you see something as you read through the New Testament where it says, the kingdom of God is like this, that's like the big obvious giveaway that what is coming is a parable. Okay? Uh, and so what we're going to read today is one of those. And it says this, because if you'll remember a couple weeks back, about Peter. Last week we talked about the, his pronunciation, the fact that when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter was the cat that stood up and he said, you're the, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that's right, Peter, that wasn't revealed to you by any man. You didn't just crack this code on your own. My father in heaven revealed that to you. And I don't know how you are. I don't know how you were as a student when you were in school. But when you get one answer right, what is your like, personal worth do in that moment? You're just like, I know stuff. It's how I do. I am, I'm a smart guy. I don't know if that's what Peter was dealing with here, but I think Peter wanted to follow up his success with success. And I think when Jesus said, that's right, Peter, Peter's like, sweet, where's my gold star? Do you like put my name on the board as student of the month? What, how does this work out? And I think maybe what Peter was dealing with here is he wanted to kind of follow that up. And so he does something here and it says this in verse 21, then Peter came to him, Jesus, and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied. And all of a sudden, Peter's like, boo, tiny little guy. Not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. That's more than seven, Jesus. Yeah, good, good math, Peter, good job. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't, he couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave him his debt. What, what preceded this? Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. This is how God works. God does this thing called forgiveness. And then verse 28, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he replied. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you a tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And people go, oh, isn't God a jerk? Well, no. God in this story is the king. The king's first response was forgiveness. 
That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So what do we learn about forgiveness in this passage? Uh, we're going to be pretty short today, but uh, uh, there's some things I want to draw out of here because forgiveness is something I think I, I could preach on forgiveness from now until Jesus comes back and we would still be learning about that. I, I think it is something that is so against our character as humans that we have to rely on the character of God and how he infuses his character into us, how he transforms us through his love, through his salvation. We have to rely on that in order to begin to wrap our brains around this forgiveness thing. And so what do we learn about forgiveness in this passage? First one is this, that forgiveness is God. God's plan. Forgiveness is God's plan. If you have ever read through the first part of Genesis, uh, as, as Adam and Eve go through the process of, of kind of being who God has made them to be and then going in through the temptation reality and then failing to, to withstand temptation and they ultimately sin, God immediately has a plan in place and he, he basically states from that point that there will be one who will not just forgive your sin, but forgive all sin, and lays out the first giving of the gospel in Genesis. And it is truly God's plan to forgive. He came up with it, not us. We, I mean, we, we cannot on our own do this thing, forgiveness. Jesus says, if you don't forgive them from your heart, like truly at the depths of your being, if you do not forgive, you are withholding God's forgiveness from yourself. Man, that's, that's heavy stuff. That's like, uh, how do I know if I've really forgiven somebody? How do I know if I've forgiven them from the heart, as the Bible says? How do I know if like I have really done it? Is it what the world says to forgive and forget? Is that, is that how we do this thing? Do we just kind of ignore it and brush it under the rug? How, how do we forgive? You see, forgiveness is God's plan, but the second thing is this, that forgiveness is not forgetting, it's actually good accounting. It's no wonder to me that in the beginning of this passage, what was the king doing? What does it say he wanted to do? He wanted to keep good accounts. He wanted to bring his accounts up to date. And so he called in the people who owed him money. <coughs> Servant was one of those. You see, the king knew exactly what man owed him. I think when we go through the process of forgiveness, oftentimes we just kind of want to sugarcoat it and kind of glaze over the top of everything and say, oh, it's okay, I forgive you. Because we don't like to actually take account of every way that we have been hurt by the actions of other people because then we think we're going to slip into really being ticked off at them and not want to forgive them, maybe. Maybe we don't have any idea the depth to which somebody has hurt us. Now let's flip it around. I think a lot of times we actually want people to forgive us with any account of what has happened. Hey man, I'm so sorry for you know that stuff that I did with the I forget, you know, but would you forgive me? That's that's cheap forgiveness. That is not biblical forgiveness. God desires that we know so that when we choose to forgive with the kind of love that God forgives us with, it's not something that's going to come back and bite us in the rear end later because we have taken account. We have taken accountability for ourselves if we're asking for forgiveness and we are taking account of the ways that we have been hurt and saying, I choose to forgive all of them. Not in part, but in full. How can we possibly forgive fully if we have not taken proper account? Biblical forgiveness doesn't just say, yeah, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's all right. No, it's not. It's never okay. Forgiveness is not saying something is okay. Forgiveness is saying what happened was absolutely wrong. It was sin. I broke relationship with you because I did this thing. The depths of the sin, the depths of the wrongness, I take full accountability for. 
and I'm not asking you to forgive me for something little. I'm asking you for full forgiveness. Or maybe you're on the other side of that and you are needing to give full forgiveness. And the reality of that is this, that quite often it is so difficult for us to forgive because there are so many ways in which we have been affected by the hurt that somebody else did to us. Which is why forgiveness early is, forgive, is better than forgiveness pushed down the road. Because when we are hurt and we let it fester for years, it begins to affect every aspect of our lives. It begins to affect how we view other people who did not even commit that sin against us, but we hold it against them because we never dealt with it with the person that actually did it. And the reality is, oftentimes, not oftentimes, sometimes... You don't even have the opportunity to deal with the person that hurt you initially because that relationship is now completely dissolved. Maybe you don't talk to them anymore. Maybe they're dead. Maybe you'll never have opportunity to have that kind of reconciliation that comes through forgiveness. But forgiveness is not forgetting. It's actually good accounting. And if we will literally go through the process and say, God, this is what I have done. Or God, this is what this person has done for me. Done to me, sorry. What I choose is to forgive them. And what I choose is to go and ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness is not forgetting, it's actually good accounting. And the third thing is this, we have a choice. You have a choice. This parable that Jesus gives, God, the master, the king, gives forgiveness when it is begged for. But then that person who just begged for forgiveness goes out and is like rejoicing and so happy that he's been... If you owed someone millions of dollars and they said, don't worry about it. I mean, if you owe millions of dollars on one of your credit cards, your credit card company is different than any other credit card company that I've ever known. But could you imagine the freedom of walking out and somebody said, yeah, don't worry about that. I forgive you of every penny. That's not reality for us, right? So let's take it to reality. I don't know when you bought your house. I know when I bought my house. It was right at the top of this thing right here. The bubble. <laughs> now my house is worth like this right down here. If somebody, if my bank came to me today and said, hey, I know every penny of what you still owe on your home. Don't worry about it. You now own this home free and clear. That's the day I will take you guys all out to eat. <laughs> on me, because I won't have to make a house payment that month. That, that's a little bit more real. I can't even fathom being forgiven millions of dollars. But this guy, instead of just enjoying the freedom and then giving that same freedom. Hey, I owe nothing. With that reality in mind, he goes to the, the guy that owns him a couple thousand dollars and says, you give it to me, you jerk. What a guy, right? But we have a choice as to how we're going to respond here. Are we going to say, God, Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for giving me forgiveness in the reality that my sin has separated me from you and I can do nothing about fixing that myself, but you already forgave it. God, thank you. And yet oftentimes we turn around to our family members, to our neighbors, to people in the church, to people outside the church and say, oh, I could never forgive them for what they did to me. We have a choice. And the fourth thing is this, that you are the only limit to God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness can cover anything you have ever done. It's, it's already been paid for. The only limit to that is you. According to this passage, I'm not making this stuff up. The king had already forgiven. It was already done. It was already given that way. But because this man went out and did not forgive the way he was forgiven, God says, that's, that's not okay. You're, you're limiting my willingness to forgive by your unwillingness to forgive. 
God wants to forgive. Again, that's his plan. That's his desire. I know many of you well enough to know that you've been hurt. Please do not limit God's forgiveness for you by your unwillingness to forgive those who have hurt you. It's not hurting them that you're not forgiving them. It might be a little bit, but not to the level that it's hurting you. Forgive. Yes, take account. These are all the ways this sin that you've done against me has hurt me. And I'm not talking like little stuff. I know that there has been sexual abuse. There have been things that are just heart-wrenching realities. Make a list. Write it down. These are the ways that that sin against me has affected me, has literally damaged my ability to love other people. I'm going to make a list of those things, and then I'm going to give that list to God, and I'm going to say, God, I forgive this person for every single piece of this. And if something else comes up that I forgot to put on this list, God, I'm going to put it on the list, and I'm going to forgive again because you know exactly every single thing I have ever done, God and you still love me, you still forgive me. And Lord, I want to love, I want to forgive the way you forgive. And so, I choose forgiveness. You are the only limit to God's forgiveness. Let me go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 through 13. It says this, when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So the fifth thing is this. To follow God means to forgive others. Forgive us our sins as we, forgive, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. This may be uncomfortable reality for you. It's uncomfortable reality sometimes for me. When people do things and it ticks me off, guess what I like to do? I like to be ticked off at them. It makes me feel good. I mean, it doesn't. It just eats away at my soul. But for a little while, I want to have a pity party. That's exactly the opposite of what Jesus says to do. Forgive us as we forgive others. To follow God means to forgive others. And the sixth thing is this. Forgiveness prepares for holiness. You may not be wanting to pursue holiness. You may not understand at all what that means. I want you to be pursuing holiness. I believe God wants you to be pursuing holiness. I believe that because that's what scripture says. Holiness means to be right before God, right with him. I want your marriages to be holy with each other, that you are right with each other. But when we forgive it makes it possible for us to be right with God. When we don't forgive, we are holding all of that sin and saying, this is more important, Lord. Your forgiveness, it's great, it's wonderful, thank you, Jesus, but the things that other people have done to me, I'm gonna hold them close. These are my prized possessions, I don't wanna let them go because I get to hold these against other people. What does sin do? Keeps us away from God. I'm going to crack a secret for you here. You ready? It's not just your sin that keeps you away from God. If somebody else has sinned against you and you're hanging on to that and not forgiving them, their sin is keeping you away from God. Let it go. This is not an easy thing. This is not just some like, oh, well, I feel better now. <laughs> that may not happen for a while. But when we choose to say, God... I refuse to let anything keep me away from you. 
whether it's my sin or something that somebody else has done to me. So God, I'm asking forgiveness for my crud, and I need your strength to forgive those people for the crud that they have done against me. Is this making any sense, or is it just like going right over a bald head like mine? No? Good? Okay. Are we going to practice this? Yes, it makes sense. Am I going to practice it? <laughs> sure. It's not optional. If you're a Christian, you should be a good forgiver. <laughs> so let's practice that. Let's pray. Lord, you are good. I thank you for your love, for your forgiveness. Lord, we forget oftentimes all that you have forgiven us for. And we take your forgiveness for granted. Lord, we don't want to do that. We thank you. We praise you for the freedom that you have given us, all that you have forgiven us. God, that's like the millions and millions of dollars forgiven this servant. God, you have forgiven us that. And so, Lord, I pray now that you would do in us the work that makes it possible for us to forgive the way you forgive so that we can love the way you love, so that we can be holy as you are holy. God, you are good. We praise you and we thank you for this time together. And Lord, as we bask in the freedom that comes from your forgiveness, Lord, we want to be able to give that same gift of freedom to those who have hurt us so that we can be you with skin on in the lives of people that don't yet know you, so that we can draw them closer to you. Because God, as they get to know forgiveness from us, they will begin to know forgiveness from you. So Lord, you have taught us this morning, you have revealed to us a truth about sin, that it keeps us from you whether it's ours or somebody else. And so, God, we, we choose to give forgiveness. And, God, that may take weeks for us to write down every single way that we have been hurt. But, God, as we write those things down, help us to choose to forgive in that moment. And when that hurt rears its head again, God, help us to forgive again. God, you are good. We thank you and we praise you. You have provided a way for us to come to you, and you have provided far more than that even. God, you have taken care of every single one of our needs. Even when we fear, Lord, you're taking care of us. And so, God, as we continue to worship this morning, as we, as a church, prepare ourselves to practice safety, God, we also choose to practice this thing called giving, being generous. And so, God, right now, as the ushers are coming forward, we choose to worship you with the giving of our tithes, that first 10% of everything you've trusted us with, God, we give it back to you. And above that, Lord, we give so that people can come to know you that we may never see. We give our offerings above and beyond just that tithe. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give in the name of Jesus Christ right now. Amen. <laughs>